Christmas season. Anybody? You know, he's all around us all the time. And uh, I've been looking forward to this. I, I'm reminded of a story that uh, Barry Landrum told when I was a student and came here. And, and he said, one day he got up here and Barry had his, always had a little notebook and he had his sermons in line, page after page, and he would put it out right before he preached during the Sunday school hour. And one Sunday he was preaching and he turned the note. He said, and Adam said to Eve, he turned the note and looked, and something was there. He said, there seems to be a leaf missing here. <laughs> <laughs> Barry was always full of practical jokes. One time he put a note on Lee Milton's windshield. I'm sorry I hit your car. I'll get back with you. <laughs> and he looked out of the office and there was Lee looking all around his car, <laughs> wondering what went on. Barry stayed here a few years, and he, and he moved to Beaufort, South Carolina, and he did a revival in Clinton. And so a number of us went over to Clinton, and uh, Lee went with us, and he saw Barry, and he said, Barry, you need to buy a mobile home as much as you're moving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. As I've been praying about this journey together, I just want to share that there is a sense in me that I believe the Holy Spirit is putting there that I'm joining you at a good time in the life of your history because God is up to something significant and good in the life of the people who call themselves Lillington Baptist Church. I really feel that. And that the future is just as bright as the promises of God. And I think, God, what a time for you to allow me to come here and join this journey, a church that nurtured Joyce and I as a young couple and set us in good ways of being God's people. Now, my journey as a pastor, I have discovered many, many Christians, certainly a lot of non-Christians, carry baggage that God doesn't want us to carry. He had never intended for us to carry. And, and I thought it would be good for us as we begin this journey together on this very first Sunday of this new year, that we, we look at some baggage that God doesn't want us to carry. And we're going to look at four things that I have experienced in 40 years of ministry is the most common baggage many people carry. Jean and Betty Sue Stewart are here that this morning. It's so good to see them. They were part of the Boys Creek congregation. I remember one Sunday looking out upon the congregation, and as I looked at people's faces, one out of every three people was carrying something I knew about that was weighing them down and they were concerned about. You know what? I've discovered that's true just about every Sunday. People carry things. Uh, so I want us to look at some of these things that I've seen most prevalent that people carry, and I want us to put them down this morning. At the end of the message, I'm going to give you a time of quietness and with the Holy Spirit to ask him to help you identify some things he doesn't want you to carry anymore. So it's very important that everybody have one of these cards. If you don't have one, we'll get you one. It's very important. Because at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to indicate any baggage the Holy Spirit may bring up to you, to indicate it on this card, and then I'm going to ask you to do what the people in the 830 service did. Come over to the cross of Jesus and lay that indication of that baggage in the basket at the cross of Jesus. Does anybody not have one of these cards? Okay, uh, they'll get you some. Raise your hands because I want it to be... It's very important. You see, whenever we come to worship, God wants to meet with us in worship. And I, I love worship because it's really been on the last 20 years that I began learning what worship is. You know, as a preacher, uh, I, I just learned what I did coming to worship. You ever do that? You just learn by rote. And uh, <clears throat> there was a guy in the Bowie's Creek Church named 
Leon Burgess who taught me, he said at, after the age of 35, he never went to a bad worship service. I said, Leon, you've got to be kidding me. He said, no. He said, if it was bad, it was because of me, not because of what the choir or the preacher did. It made me start thinking. When was the last time you left a worship setting and said, I was a lousy worshiper today? Or have you ever left and said, I didn't get anything out of that message today? Boy, I didn't like that choir piece. You know what? I've learned worship is not about us. It's about the one we worship. And we come with the, I come with the expectation that God is going to be here and we're going to experience his presence through our singing and through the praying and, and somehow God wants to break through. The one thing that hinders worship is S. I N. Now, who can tell me what that word spells? Those letters spell. What does it spell? Sin. It could be your sin or my sin can hinder all of our worship. Sometime I'll talk to you about the sin of Achan in the Old Testament and how it affected the people. But worship today, so let's come with this expectation that God is really wants to communicate with us this word. I, I'm just a vessel. I listen to him as I speak and say, Lord, what is it you're saying to my heart? And there are two scripture verses I want us to look at this morning. One is a command to be followed by the followers of Jesus. And you know, when a command is given, we are to obey it. You got that? When the Bible gives us a command, our response is not to debate it, but to obey it. So Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The command to throw off everything that hinders so we can run the race. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, notice it, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the other is an invitation that Jesus extends to us. And it's really this invitation that makes it possible and easy for us to throw off the things that weigh us down, the excess baggage, so we can run the race before us. Now, you have to realize when you receive an invitation, you have to respond. You understand that? In other words, Jesus receives, gives you an invitation, but it's up to us to respond. And in Matthew 11... 28 and 30. This is what Jesus said. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Will you pray with me? Lord, let your blessing be upon the message today. Have mercy on the speaker. He is a sinner in need of your grace. Have mercy upon the listeners that we might hear what you have in store. Will you speak to all of us this morning so that when this service comes to an end, we have identified and given to you the excess baggage that you want to carry. Thank you for this time for us to be the gathered church. We offer this prayer relying upon the name of Jesus in Christ whom we pray. Amen. Forty years of ministry has taught me 
a lot of people who sit on the pew Sunday after Sunday carry excess baggage that God does not intend for us to carry. Certainly there are many people who do not know Christ and follow Christ. The baggage they carry is often overwhelming. But for some Christians, they have been carrying baggage for a long time. And some of us have picked up some baggage this past year that we do not need to be carrying. So this morning, I want to urge us to set these baggages down at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And do you know what Jesus carried to the cross? He carried the cross itself. But more importantly, he carried our sins and they were nailed to the cross, and that's where they were to stay. Listen, for the cross of Christ to become our cross, we need to carry some things to the cross and leave them there. And so I thought on this first Sunday of a new year, let this be the day that you and I leave at the foot of the cross baggage that you don't need to be carrying. And let's begin with our bad moments. I mean, you talk about a heavy bag. Your bad moments. What do you regret doing? What do you wish you had never done? When the memories of these things come to surface, there's an accusation in your head that says, I'm such a failure. I guess I'm just a bad person. I just don't know how God could love me for what I've done. I I'm just bad. Mary was a bouncy, outgoing college student who enjoyed her days at Campbell, especially Thursday and Friday evenings. For when I was there, that, there were the party nights. About 8 p.m. one Tuesday evening, there was a knock at the parsonage door, and I opened the door. And when I opened it, there stood Evelyn holding Mary by the arm. And I said, come in. And by the look and expression on their faces, I I knew that what they were going to share was not good news. That evening I learned that Mary was pregnant and Evelyn was concerned about what Mary may do. And I listened carefully and we talked about several options to save the life of the child she was carrying. And I prayed with them and reminded them that God loves them and God could help them through this. And I said, Mary, let's get together on Friday. When Friday came, Mary didn't show up. The next week I saw Evelyn. She said she had seen Mary, and Mary seemed to be so happy, and she said she was at peace and that everything was going to be okay. Three months later, I learned that Mary had an abortion. And I didn't see or hear from her for five years. And then one day I walked up to the post office, and I had a letter from her. She was now living in Raleigh. She told me in that letter that the night she came to see me, she didn't see any way out of her situation other than to have an abortion. And she said immediately she felt a real sense of relief that she didn't have to confront her parents and do anything else. And then two years later, as she was getting ready to get married, she said she started having nightmares. And after her marriage, for the next three years, she said, I constantly fought depression and, and frequently felt shame and overridden with guilt about her abortion. Instead of writing Mary a return letter, I called her. And I told her I was so glad to hear from her and remind her how much God loves her and that God has a plan for us when we make mistakes. That we, we are not to pretend that it never happened. We're not to rationalize or, or justify what we did. I said, Mary, by the power of God's Holy Spirit, He can help you deal with what you are feeling, the painful memories of your mistake. And I read to a Romans eleven twenty seven, where Paul wrote, in referring to Jesus, I will make this covenant with them when I take away their sins. I make this covenant with them when I take away their sins. Mary, what did this verse say? What did God promise? And she said, well, he promises to take away our sin. 
I said, Mary, I, I notice that Christians understand what it means to be forgiven of our sins, but we don't always understand what it means for God to take away or to remove our sins. There's a fine difference. I mean, we're aware that God has forgiven of our mistakes, but sometimes we continue to live with the memories of them, the embarrassment, the regret, the shame, and we allow those mistakes to keep us from being really free the way God wants us to be free. Listen, Mary, when, when Jesus was on the cross, he just didn't feel our sin, but he felt the consequences of our sin. He felt the shame the embarrassment, the humiliation, the regret. And if he felt it then, why do we need to feel it today? Mary, the point is, you don't and I don't. And I said, Mary, let, let me tell you what Jesus said. And I took out and I read Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And Mary, I want to tell you a way that you can come to Jesus to find that rest he wants you to have. I said, you got a Bible closed? She said, yes. I said, turn to 1 John 1, 8, 9. You might want to do that in your Bibles. 1 John 1, 8, 9. I said, I want you to, Mary, read this verse out loud to me several times. She fumbled through the pages of the Bible and she found it and she read. If, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Mary, what does that verse begin with? If. I said it's conditional. There's something we've got to do. We've got to confess our sins. And what's his promise? He forgives us. I said, but what else does it say? It's more than just forgiving. What does it say? He purifies us. He cleanses us. He removes the sin from us. I said, Mary, will you do something right now? Will you just pray a prayer of confession to Jesus and let me listen in? So on the telephone through her tears, she confessed what she had done and how she felt about it and asked for forgiveness. And when she said amen, I said, Mary... I want you to know, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I want you to know by the authority of God's word, you are forgiven. In another conversation with her a week later, she said, last week, the first time in five years, I experienced the grace of God. And do you want to know something else? When I lay my head down on the pillow every night, I have no more bad dreams. Do you see what happened? When Mary laid down her shame and guilt at the foot of the cross, Jesus took them up, and she didn't have to carry them anymore. It was the baggage she no longer needed to have. You see, you set down a major baggage piece of luggage that you don't need to be carrying when you give your bad moments to God. Are there mistakes from yesterday that really hinder you from living freely today? Bad choices, regretful acts, mistakes that sometimes cause you to have sleepless nights, mistakes or sin that is so down deep in your soul you don't think about them much but you're never really free to be free in Jesus to have the joy he wants to have because you have never dealt with it and it's sort of blocking the flow of what he wants to do in and through you. I want to suggest this morning, leave them at the foot of the cross. See, you're not strong enough to carry them. And while you are there, give God your mad moments, your mad moments. There was this man who was bitten by a dog, and he went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you got rabies. And the man said, give me a pad. And he started writing on the pad, and the doctor said, you don't understand. You can be cured from rabies. You, you, you don't need to make a will. The man said, I'm not making a will. 
I'm just writing down a list of all the people I want to bite. <laughs> Couldn't we all make such a list? You learn already, friends are not always friendly. Neighbors are not always neighborly. Some workers never work. Some bosses are too bossy. You learn that a promise made is not always a promise kept. And just because someone called you dead doesn't mean you act like one. And even though they said yes on the altar, they have said no to you in marriage. And you learn as a result that we tend to keep and bite back to keep a list of the people who have hurt us. And God would love for us this morning to give him that list. I mean, who's on your list? You know, Paul inspired us. He wrote, love keeps what? No record of wrong. Love doesn't keep list. I have learned through the years of ministry it is impossible to live the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live if we have unforgiveness in our hearts. It's impossible. Don't think it is. It is impossible. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount as he was teaching his disciples to pray. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, but, that's a big word there. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, I didn't write that. I like to have some wiggle room. But there is no wiggle room here with Jesus. I am convinced that the most unhappiest of people, and the people who have, tend to be sour and negative, that somewhere down in their life there is a root of some hurt or some shame or something submit to them, and they've never let it go. They've never forgiven, and it affects everything they do. In my years of ministry, I have seen and experienced the number one sin among most of us, including myself, who sit on a pew is that sometimes we harbor a grudge or a bitterness or a hurt too long. And it hinders the flow of the Holy Spirit in us. We don't think we hold on to grudges. Who did you talk about this week? And what did you say about it? Was it good? Or was it the pain they inflicted upon you? The disappointment they gave you? The hurt that you felt? Do you know what that's called? Repeat after me. S-I-N. Sin. That's what it is. We had a guy in our church named Marvin Cavanagh. He died last year. Lived 99 years old. Great man of God. Loved everybody. In, in the 20 years that I was his pastor, I never heard him say one negative thing about anybody else. Someone would die, and we had about 300 funerals there, and I said, he'd say, Pastor, that was a good person. That was a good lady. His daughters were school teachers, and when they would start complaining about someone, said, don't put any more problems on somebody else. They already have enough to deal with them. Build them up. Don't tear them down. I have discovered in the Church of Jesus Christ of all denominations the biggest problem we have is somebody does something that we don't like, says something we don't like, and we hold on to it and we get angry with them and we never, never let it go. Here again the words of Jesus. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you of your sins. That's heavy, isn't it? And we Christians sometimes think we live sinless. 
We'll get on this later. I've discovered the one thing I hear, at least among Christians, the people confessing their own sins. That has become a regular routine in my life, but we'll talk more about that. Because God wants to set us free. Listen, you will never forgive anybody any more than God has already forgiven you. When Jesus was on the cross, stretched out in pain and torture, what did he say to the people who were killing him? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He did what he told us to do. So why don't you lead your, your mad moments at the foot of the cross? Besides, does it really help you to keep a list? Does it make it you happy because you do? Are you a better person because you can catalog and enumerate all the hurts that have come into your world? And do people rush up to you and say, now tell me again about that fellow who hurt you. Tell me again about that lady who mistreated you. Does that make you a better, well-rounded person? Absolutely not. We got them all labeled. You know what they did to me? You know what they did down at that church? You know what that person did to that other person? Are you any better for sharing that? Do people enjoy going down into the cellar of your heart? I am convinced the number one problem that hinders the flow of the Holy Spirit more than anything else and unhappiness is because people have harbored something instead of letting it go and giving it to Jesus through forgiveness. Instead, they keep their resentment on, they hold on to it, and their hurts become their hates, and then it becomes venom that shares out. Do you want to know how, know whether or not you've forgiven a person? I had to learn that. I learned this in Bowie's Creek. There was this guy who did something horrendous, and I started praying for forgiveness for for two years. And, and I, whenever I saw him, you know what I would do? Same thing you do, avoid him. He was on that side of the street, I certainly wouldn't walk down that side of the street. If he was in church, I certainly wouldn't go and sit with him. But I started asking God. It was a process. God, I forgive him. You help me. God, I forgive him. So you gotta, you, you can't just forgive, sometimes you just got to work through it. You got to ask for God's help. And, and I saw him one day outside of the hospital in Dunn, and I said, how are you doing, old buddy? It's good to see you. I was free to talk with him. I was free. And I turned around and went home. I said, free at last, free at last. Thank God I'm free at last. Are there some people, if they would sit beside you, you would squirm and hush up? That's an indication. Maybe there's some forgiveness. Or, or, or another way it sort of subtly comes out. You know, you're going along fine. You're not thinking about it. But something, you're in a conversation with a person, and it triggers you of, of a hurt that happened to you. And you sort of spread out the venom about what happened. Oh, ever so politely. You know, that means it's like pus there. You've pricked it, and it's still there. It's a boil that keeps pouring over and over. That's an indication then that you need to work on and ask God's help and give it to him. You see, when we do these kinds of things, we're doing the devil's work. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. You'll honor God this morning if you say, I, I've been carrying around my mad moments long enough and I'm going to give them to him. Again, it's not necessarily endorsing or approving what another person had done. You're just acknowledging that God is bigger than you are, and you're going to turn it over to him. So give him your, your mad moments. Give him your bad moments. Do you have any of these that you, you really need to give to him this morning? The bag sort of gets heavy, doesn't it? What about your anxious moments? just read a, from, about an article in the, the Atlantic Journal. Listen to what it says. America is turning into a country of hand-wringers. 
Nearly one in five adults, that is 40 million Americans, now suffers from some form of di anxiety disorder. The most common psychiatric ailment we face today is a panic anxiety, and the second most common is, is depression. One in 10 of every American is depressed. It is now estimated that over a lifetime, the percentage of Americans who will suffer from a diagnosable anxiety or depression disorder will be one out of every three. I read last year that depression has increased 40,000 times since World War II. I don't know if this is true, but I, it was an interesting said said that last year the article said 70% of all women, get this, all women who have medical benefits are taking some form of antidepressant. Whew. I asked a pharmacist, I said, you think that's true? He said, I don't know, but in my pharmacy we certainly give out a lot of antidepressant medicine. Well, we probably need that. But anxiety is big. Uh, Irma Bombach brought a, made a list one time of things that gave her anxiety, and on that list she included things like, I wor worry about Carol Channing going bald. I'm worried that somebody is finally going to tell me that lettuce is fattening after all. I worry that if I die with three hours, I will die with three hours left on my cold capsule. And most of all, I'm worried about what my dog thinks when I step out of the shower. <laughs> Paul said, do not be anxious about anything. I mean, what are we to do with those worries? What are you worried about today? Did, did you get some news from a doctor? Did you look at your bank statement and said, oh, how am I going to make it? Are you worried about your job, your children, your grandchildren, your future? What do you do with these worries? Well, we can carry them around with us. And you know what they do? They become a heavy bag to carry. But you know what we can do with those worries? We can take them to the cross. We can take all of them and sit them down at the foot of the cross. We can look at the blood he shed for you. We can look at the crown he wore for you. We can look at the spear he took for you. We can look at the nails he felt for you. And we can be very quiet and hear him whisper, Did I not prove that I will take care of you? Did I not prove I will take care of you? And what does Paul tell us to do? But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's a command. And the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understandings, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Honestly, don't you think what Jesus did on the cross, that he will take care of all of us? The Apostle Paul put it this way. God did not keep back his own son, but gave him up for all of us. If God did that, won't he freely give us other things? See, do yourself a favor and take all your anxieties and leave them at the cross. Take your bad moments and your mad moments and your anxious moments. And there's one final bag to leave the cross. And, and this is one many people never consider. Let this be the morning you give God your final moments. Your final moments. You're going to have one, you know. Unless Christ comes first, you and I will experience a final breath, a final tick of the heart. And we don't like to talk about that, do we? We could have gone all morning and not mentioned this topic. We don't like to talk about it. And if you don't think that is true, the next time you're over with some friends home having dinner and the conversation lags, just bring up the topic. How do you feel about your upcoming death? It's a topic no one wants to discuss. I, Ten years ago, I was visiting with our senior adult minister, and this lady who was 90 years old, husband died, and the thing that struck me, even though he'd been ill a long time, 
she was not prepared for his death. She couldn't believe that he died. And I said, Coy Lee, we, we got to do something to help people. And I put together a booklet planning for your future, how to talk to your loved ones about your impending death, how to make plans, how, uh, a durable power of attorney, a living will, what to, uh, what to do with your resources and the will that you leave. And I said, if you have a will, I hope you're leaving something to Lillington Baptist Church. And if you're not leaving it there, I can tell you another place to leave it. <laughs> not to me, to w WMU in North Carolina. <laughs> That'd be a good place. And so I put together this booklet, and, and I, it was Palm Sunday, and Joyce said, what are you going to preach on? I said, I'm going to give this booklet out. And I said, Jesus' disciples never get, got it when he told them that he was going to die. And I want you to know, that day, people took 200 of those booklets, and another 200 were printed, and went to hospice, and if you'd like something like that to help you deal with this yourself, I'll bring some. We'll run them off and you can have them. It's just a helpful tool because one day we're going to die. So why don't you give God your final moments? I mean, do you live in fear of your final moments? Do you live in fear of traffic accidents or airplanes or cancer? In January of 1999, Amanda, age 44, mother of two, learned that she had a very aggressive form of breast cancer. What made matters worse, she had no insurance. The doctor said at Baptist Hospital, there's very little they can do for her unless she could enter into a, an experimental treatment program with stem cells, and there was no guarantee with that, but she had to have $150,000 guaranteed in cash before they would even begin the procedure. Well, she had no insurance, and this was out of the question for her. She didn't have that kind of money. They told her she probably had three months to live. Now, when we heard about this, a group at First Baptist in Ashboro sprang into action, and God showed us what he could do when God's people depended upon him. And a story that needs to be told. Uh, this group that I was part of, we call professional fundraisers for health needs, and we said, we need to have this money within six weeks, and they said, it's impossible, you'll never have it. And Larry Cahoon said, you just don't know our God. He does the impossible. In six weeks, $150,000 was raised. Some people signing second mortgages and all to make sure that Amanda could have this surgery. She had the surgery, and there was great hopes for three or four months, and then the bad news came. The treatment didn't work, and it would just be a matter of time. I recall visiting Amanda in those last four months of her life, and she had the most peace of anyone I've ever seen. She told me she didn't worry about death because she trusted Jesus. She said, I gave all my troubles to Jesus, and he's with me, and I know he's going to provide for the care of my children. Incredible. I remember a couple of months before she died, I was standing in a receiving line behind her at Pew Funeral Home in Ashboro. We were there visiting a family whose six-year-old child died with cancer. And as we moved through the line, Amanda came up to the mother, Yvonne, and they just hugged and they shared tears. And she said, Yvonne, I'm going to see Michael before you do. What do you want me to tell him? She had such incredible peace. She gave her troubles to Jesus, and she knew that he was with her. Oh, you would honor God this morning if you would surrender your final moments to him. You would be exalting him and lift him up if you said, you are big enough to carry me in those final moments, and I'm just going to give it to you, and I'm not going to carry that weight. The one thing I really believe, unless there's some major sin hindering us, when God's people gather looking for him, Jesus is there. I believe that. And I believe he's here this morning. I really believe that. And I believe he's saying to you and me, why don't you t put that bag down at the foot of the cross so I can carry it, so you can be free? 
Do you recall Jesus' invitation I read at the beginning of this message? Listen to it again, and this time, listen to it from a paraphrase of the Bible called the message. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay any heavy or ill-fitting thing on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live lightly and freely. What do you need to live at the foot of the cross this morning? Jesus extends an invitation. Would you pray with me? Father, please, God, minister to these, your children. Shepherd, please reach out to touch your flock. Let not one of us here this morning leave unreminded of your love and devotion. Father, we all carry baggage around we're not intended to carry. We pick it up every morning and take it with us everywhere we go. We're a little hesitant to let it go because we become so familiar with the baggage. It's comfortable. It's what we know. And I know that you want to carry it for us. Will you ask God this question right now? What is the one bag you want me to sit down today? Ask him that. What is the one bag you want me to sit down today? Listen to the nudges of your heart. It just could be the Holy Spirit. Mark on your card the moment you want to give to Jesus. Jesus again whispers these ear, Come unto me all you are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. He really wants to do that for us today. You see, as we begin this new year to run the race that is before us, God invites us to throw off all those things that weigh us down and run the race of life ahead with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Isn't that what we really want? Then what have you been carrying? Some sin, some regret, some shame, some anger, some unforgiveness? some fear, some anxiety, your final moments. Would you indicate it on your card now? Thank you, Lord, for the invitation. We know in our minds that you're big enough to carry our baggage. Help us this day to know it in our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name.